So now in this third webcast, we're going to talk about Raynaud's phenomenon, a type of functional arterial disease, before continuing on with the small vessel vasculitides to round out our knowledge of vasculitis. So Raynaud's phenomenon is this triphasic color change of the hands or feet on cold exposure. So first you get hyperemia, so the fingers turn red, shown here. Then the, uh, you get vasoconstriction, so the fingers blanch and turn white here. And finally, you can barely see it. You can get a, a blue coloration from uh, long-term tissue hypoxia. So the important distinction to make here is that if Raynaud's phenomenon is the only disease manifestation found in a patient, we term it uh, a primary disorder and we call it Raynaud's disease. If, however, it's secondary to another process, we just saw Berger's disease or thromboangiitis obliterans, it's called Raynaud's phenomenon. And Raynaud's phenomenon can be seen with a whole bunch of different connective tissue diseases and vasculitides, uh, so that's why we're including it here. You can see it with lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. The treatment is to avoid cold exposure, mittens rather than gloves, uh, and calcium channel blockers may have some role in helping. So that's Raynaud's phenomenon, which we sort of detoured into because it came up with thromboangitis obliterans. Now what we're going to do is talk about the small vessel vasculitides, which are broken up into immune complex mediated ones and ANCO associated ones. So to break that out further, the immune complex mediated small vessel vasculitis that we're going to be talking about is henox schoenlein purpura. And then the ANCO associated vasculitides that we're going to be talking about are granulomatosis with polyangiitis which is formerly known as Wegener's granulomatosis, microscopic polyangiitis, and Churg-Strauss syndrome. Now it's important to note that this sort of cluster of three ANCA-associated vasculitides are also sometimes called posse immune vasculitis, not because they're ANCA-associated, but because in contrast to, for example, henox shine purpura, when you do a biopsy, you're not going to see immune complexes. The biopsy itself is posseimmune, so it's just another way of sort of lumping these diseases together. So henox schoenlein purpura, and you can see it has a very characteristic appearance. Uh, it's a disease of small vessels affecting young children less than 10 years old, and the key manifestation is IgA deposition in the capillaries and venules, which leads to these necrotizing lesions. You can see the necrosis in the center of these lesions here. And, and the thing that gives us its name is palpable purpura. So these are raised. Uh, these purpura are usually found in the buttocks or lower extremities. There are other symptoms that can go along with it. Uh, patients can complain of polyarthralgia, usually the lower extremities, but not necessarily arthritis per se, abdominal pain, renal involvement. And the renal involvement is uh, basically IgA deposition in the glomeruli. Now often, interestingly, henox schoenlein purpura is uh, preceded by a URI type illness, and if this is sounding kind of familiar from your renal unit, it should because there's a lot of overlap between this and IgA nephropathy, but the difference is with IgA nephropathy you don't really get the purpura. The good news is the prognosis of this disease is usually very good and it's usually self-resolving, although if symptoms are very severe, steroids can help. So that's henox schoenlein purpura. Now let's talk about the ANCA-associated vasculitides, but before that we need to kind of recap what ANCA is in the first place. So what is ANCA? ANCA, all that stands for are, is anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. And you can see these antibodies in vasculitis or other autoimmune disorders, and remember that ANCA is classified into two major categories. So there's perinuclear ANCA, and you can see here on this uh, immunofluorescence, uh, this sort of linear perinuclear illumination, so perinuclear ANCA pattern, and cytoplasmic an ANCA, and you can see these neutrophils where the cytoplasm is, is what's fluorescing. So these are often abbreviated into P ANCA and C ANCA, but over the last several years we've sort of discovered what the specific antigens are. So instead of these histological patterns of perinuclear and cytoplasmic, Oftentimes, P ANCA goes by antimyeloperoxidase, or MPO ANCA, which is the typically the major target of these antibodies, and C ANCA goes by antiprotonase 3 or PR3 ANCA. So you may see either C ANCA or PR3 ANCA, referring to sort of a cytoplasmic pattern, or P ANCA or MPO ANCA, uh, 
referring to sort of a perinuclear pattern. So that's ANCA. Now let's get into the actual ANCA-associated vasculitides. The first one to talk about is granulomatosis with polyangiitis, uh, which I'm calling the vasculitis formerly known as Wegener's granulomatosis. The name was sort of officially changed finally in about 2012 or 2013 because Wegener, it turned out, was a Nazi. So now it goes by another name, which is actually good for us because the name is much more descriptive and it tells us what the two pathologic hallmarks are. So the two pathologic hallmarks of this disease are granuloma formation and necrotizing vasculitis of the small arteries and veins. So here we have a, a small artery that um, you can see a lot of sort of vasculitis and neutrophil infl infiltration and perhaps over out here is the beginning of a granuloma. So granulomatosis with polyangiitis affects middle-aged patients and it is associated with C-ANCA positivity or PR3 ANCA positivity. There's a classic triad to know about and uh, that triad is involvement of the upper respiratory system, lower respiratory system, and renal involvement. So if you see those three things in a patient, then you should think about granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So the initial phase is often involvement of the upper respiratory tract. And you can get mucosal ulcerations, frequent uh, upper respiratory tract infections, and pain and a purulent discharge from the nose. You can have a lot of nasal destruction. You can see here some nasal destruction. And you can also have fistula formation. The next phase of uh, granul granulomatosis with polyangiitis is, is called the chronic phase. And classically, this involves the lungs and the kidneys. And you can have hemoptysis, for example. And kidney manifestations usually include glomerulonephritis. And treatment is steroids or cyclophosphamide. Shown here is an example of the type of lung involvement that can be had. Uh, you can see here these cavitary lung lesions uh, from this patient with granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So the next small vessel vasculitis that's ANCA associated to talk about is microscopic polyangiitis. And again, this involves small vessels. It can begin with constitutional symptoms. And the major manifestation of this disease is renal involvement. Uh, renal involvement in the form of nephritic syndrome, which often clinically presents as a rac rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, and, uh, and may, you may have crescents on kidney biopsy. In addition to renal involvement, in this disease as well, there's also pulmonary involvement. So you can have, for example, pulmonary capillaritis or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Now there's a couple of overlaps that we're going to contrast in this slide and the next. One is between the overlap between micro excuse me, microscopic polyangiitis and polyarteritis nodosa. These two are in fact thought to be one disease until they were split out from one, in one another in the 40s and 50s. So one difference is that in microscopic polyangiitis, typically the lesions are sort of the same age. In polyarteritis nodosa, remember we said that the lesions can be of different ages. My microscopic polyangiitis involves the small caliber vessels, and polyarteritis nodosa involves larger caliber, caliber vessels. Another key distinguishing feature is that microscopic polyangiitis involves the lung, whereas polyarteritis nodosa spares the lung. Microscopic polyangiitis can involve the venules, but polyarteritis nodosa doesn't really involve the venules. And lastly, microscopic polyangiitis has positivity with uh, P. anca, so it's got P. anca positivity, but polyarteritis nodosa has no association with anca. The other contrast to draw is between microscopic polyangiitis and granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So these two small vessel vasculitides that are ANCA associated can often overlap because they both involve pulmonary and renal uh, uh, cyst, cyst, excuse me, symptoms. So, but some of the contrasting features are that microscopic polyangiitis spares the upper airway, whereas granulomatosis with polyangiitis involves the upper airway. Uh, the ANCA positivity is different. Microscopic polyangiitis is P ANCA positive and granulomatosis with polyangiitis is C ANCA positive. You don't have any granulomasome biopsy in microscopic poly uh, polyangiitis, but granulomatosis with polyangiitis, you do have granuloma formation. And finally, uh, and this is much less important, you tend to not see pulmonary nodules with microscopic polyangiitis, even though it involves the lungs, whereas you do tend to see pulmonary nodules with granulomatosis with polyangiitis when lung involvement occurs. <laughs>
So those are just two slides to help you contrast microscopic polyangiitis from a couple of diseases it might be confused with. The last ANCA-associated vasculitis we should talk about is Churg-Strauss syndrome. Fortunately, it's a very rare disease, about one in a million, and it has a classic triad associated with it involving asthma, allergic rhinitis, and nasal polyps. Typically, patients with Churg-Strauss syndrome have a peripheral eosinophilia, so maybe there's a strong allergic component in the pathogenesis of the disease. And there's also vasculitis involved. PNCA positivity is present in about 50% of the patients. Now, in addition to really the respiratory and pulmonary symptoms, the asthma is really what predominates. There are other manifestations that can occur with Churg-Strauss syndrome. So one that's really common is, again, mononeuritis multiplex. It's seen in about 70% of the patients. Uh, patients can develop myocarditis in about 15% of the cases, and that myocarditis comes from eosinophilic infiltrates in the myocardium. Palpable purpura may be present, and renal involvement is really less common with this disease than in the other two diseases in the subclassification, but it can still occur. Treatment, again, is corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide. So that wraps up our tour of the different vasculitides. We talked about large, medium, and small vessel vasculitis. Uh, along the way, we talked about functional arterial disease. And in the next screen test, we'll talk about vascular tumors.